So there was a girl, about 14 years of age, and she was growing up in a legendary city, a city famous for where a king had lived. But her life was ordinary. She lived in an ordinary family, did ordinary things, and as part of her ordinary life at 14 years old, someone asked her to marry him, and she said yes. Her name was Mary, and she said yes to this man named Joseph. But one day, she had a revelation. And the revelation was is that she was going to give birth to the Son of God, and that that day, she was going to become pregnant. Bethlehem is supposed to be the place where Jesus was born. And many people believe the Gospels placed Jesus' birth in Bethlehem in order to fulfill a Jewish prophecy because others believe he was born in Nazareth, the village where he grew up. I'm Robert Fiducia, and like many of you, I have grown up hearing the stories of the manger and the virgin, the wise men, the shepherds, the star, but now I'm interested in physical proof that shows why this small town in the Judean desert is the place that's revered as the birth of Jesus. To aid in this journey, I met up with theology student Louisa Court and Father Chris Ryan, a seminary director in Australia, to learn why this town is believed to be the birthplace. We're here in Manger Square. I invited you to come to be our guide. Tell us where we are and what we're seeing right now. So as you said, we're here in Manger Square, which is the big square behind us that um, really welcomes the story of Jesus and his birth. Uh, behind us, this, or in front of us this way, is the Church of the Nativity. Yeah. Now this is the church that was built in the sixth century, but it was built over a church that was built in the fourth century when Constantine first um, started to build churches in the yeah. Holy Land in places where Jesus had been. So of course it was important to come to Bethlehem and build a church there. When he and his, uh, really his mother and the people she was associated with came to this place, they found a story, a tradition of people saying, this is where Jesus was born. So the church is a really, um, it's one of those great uh, Holy Land churches in that it's an amazing uh, mixture of, of history of different levels um, you can still see the mosaics on the floor of that 4th century church and then you walk inside and you're in a 6th century church um, or you look at the outside here and it's a 6th century church but then you go down uh, underneath the floor to some caves and there's a long standing tradition right back to the definitely from the 2nd century and probably earlier that Jesus was born in a cave, and that's because Bethlehem is dotted with caves. Yeah. And so you go down into a little cave, what we call the grotto, and there's a star on the floor, yeah. and you can place your hand there and you touch the rock, oh my God. which where we believe Jesus was born. Uh, and then just behind you and to the right is a, another grotto that they call the manger grotto, which they believe is where, when Mary had given birth, it's where they placed the baby Jesus. They placed the child uh, in this another little alcove of yeah. the same cave. Wow. Um, and so we're going to have a chance to celebrate Mass in yeah, that right. place. Oh my <laughs> God. That's right. so, oh my God. Thank you for arranging that. For yeah. She held these things quiet in her heart, but when she said that she was pregnant to Joseph, Joseph's inclination was to divorce her. But he had a dream that said, don't divorce the girl. Instead, bring her into your house because she is going to give birth to the Son of God. So Mary knew and Joseph knew that they were going to give birth to the Son of God. But Joseph knew that this king in the city was very harsh and would be threatened by the thought of the Son of God being born in this city. Okay, so the story, we all know the story quite well from, from the Gospels and from, you know, Christmas every year, but, but can you separate for us 
I suppose the myth from what we can actually know is, is fact, or so I suppose, about, about that story of Jesus' birth? I think in a lot of ways it's not so much about a myth as our perception. So okay. we, we have this picture in our minds of what the Christmas story looks like. Mm-hmm. So you've got Joseph uh, leading Mary on a donkey, she's yeah. heavily pregnant, and they get here just in time to have the baby <laughs> with a towel and a belt around the head. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and also that they come and that there's no room at the inn, and so yeah. that then they get sort of cast out into the stable. Yeah. yeah. Right. Now, the thing is, if we read the Gospels more closely, um, we get a much more accurate picture of what that's what that actually ha- what really happened there. Really? So we have this popular perception, yeah. but the reality looks a little bit different, I think. So what do we know? We know that this was Joseph's hometown. And from Matthew's version, Joseph was living here with his family, as in his parents, mm-hmm. and with Mary. And so they're already here. And when it says that, that classic line, there was no room at the inn, you could translate it like that, but really the, the more accurate translation would be there was no, there was no room in the living space. Mm-hmm. And so what I need you to imagine is that the homes here in Bethlehem at that time were really small, yeah. one bedroom, one room, not just one bedroom, wow. but one room. Right. Yeah. And then they would back onto a cave and the cave would have a place for storage and it would also be where the animals were because everybody, every homeowner would have their own small number of animals. Like now, a garage. A lot like yeah, that, yeah, okay, a lot like right. that garage, yeah. yeah. Right. So what would happen would be when we sit, when we hear that there wasn't enough room, maybe it was just simply a case that they went, let's go out the back because it's going to be a little quieter. It's really busy in this main room. Yeah. And so then they're out in the cave, and here we get the story and the birth of this tradition, which is that Jesus is born in the cave, and it's also where the animals were. And so his place then in the manger, which is that. The word manger is that feeding trough for the animals. Yeah, yeah. So that gives us, I think, probably a much more accurate perception of what the birth would look like. People have been coming here to the Church of the Nativity for centuries to worship and venerate in the grotto, the cave widely believed to be the birthplace of Jesus. Yes, Sydney. Before we left, Father Chris was granted permission to offer a small Christmas Mass in the grotto. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. Glory, glory to God in the highest. And on earth. God could have written in the stars, I exist. God could have, you know, put it in, in the heavens for all to see. These days, he could have put it on Facebook, you know. But he wanted to be loved, and so he became a little baby. He became a little baby. So in a moment, we're about to celebrate Eucharist. And one of the, one of the great, beautiful, symbolic moments of this story is that here, in this grotto, we believe that he was placed in a manger, which was a food trough for animals. You've got to remember that he's, the, he's seemingly the child of an insignificant couple in a very remote part of the Roman Empire. Yeah. So if he'd been the son of a great king, well, there might be written documents, but we don't have that because nobody at the time yeah. quite knew who he was. Yeah. So we've got Matthew and Luke's versions of the story, and they're important because they really clearly both say that he was born here in Bethlehem. What we also have, though, is a remembrance, what we might call a tradition. So we're talking in the early second century, we have a number of figures saying, this is when, this is where he was born, and in particular, in this general vicinity. Not long after that, you have the Emperor Hadrian come along, and he's very keen to stamp out this new Christian group. And so in around 130, some of the great shrines of Christianity are turned into pagan temples. 
and this was one of those spaces it was created it was turned into a big forest or a big wood and the idea was that the people the locals were to encourage to worship um, one of the local gods of fertility here which in a funny kind of way is negative evidence that this was a really important place yeah. you don't you don't go to this spot and as emperor hadrian and say um, let's make sure we expunge your memory of the Christian story, yeah. unless there's something really important here. And then as soon as the peace of Constantine comes, we have a, uh, uh, people coming here and saying, this is the spot to yeah. build a church. So that was the year 130 that they said, we need to build something here. So prior to 130 then, going back to the first century, people were coming here and saying, this is the spot. Amazing. Wow, that's incredible. From here, we headed up north to the Sea of Galilee to learn more about the early life of Jesus of Nazareth. We grew up in Nazareth, yeah. which is sort of down this way. Yeah. These days, that's about a 35 minute drive. Okay. But he obviously would have taken a bit longer to walk. Yeah. But he spent the first 30 years of his life after leaving Bethlehem yeah. as, a, as a little baby. Or, um, he spent it there in, in Nazareth, and then he comes up here. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what do we know about his time in Nazareth then, as a, as a kid? Well, the funny thing is we don't know that much about it. Yeah. yeah. So most of the gospel stories really pick up when he begins his public ministry. Yeah, right. But we've got a few little bits and pieces. Practically, I mean, what did he do day to day? Like he was, yeah. he was the son of Joseph, as far as the people of Nazareth were concerned. And we call Joseph a tecton, which means usually it's translated as carpenter. A better translation, like he's he's a stonemason, he's a he's a woodworker. He would have he wouldn't have necessarily had a shop it so much as he would have gone and worked on a building site and helped build something. And he could have could have made a table. He could have also put together the wood for found you know a key kind of structural piece like a you know a, what we would call a shed or a, yeah. a you know a barn. Yeah. You know. Right. So Jesus would have done that. Yeah. Jesus would have done that. So Jesus grew up in a town of about 200 or 400 people. In that town, Joseph set up his work as a carpenter. A tecton is the word. He worked with wood, he worked with stone, made houses, made plows, made oxen yoke, all around the little area. And as a good son, Jesus took up that trade and he learned how to do that. But as he got older, he saw that he was different he called God, Daddy, Abba. And the way he talked about God, it was not the way that his friends talked about God. It was not the way it was when he went to the synagogue that he would hear other people talk about God. There was an intimacy, a closeness, a tenderness that nobody else seemed to have. I think it's really important for us to understand that first century Palestine was really, really different. 21st yeah. century. Yeah. Um, you know, we're talking about a very different culture. We're talking about a very, a very big difference in time. Um, and so it's important to understand that. That's part of why the scriptures are often hard to read, uh, because they're actually talking about a, a place and context that's very different to our own. Yeah. Having said that, there's something really important to, to grasp here, I think, is that the aspirations of, of a human being, I think there's a consistency, continuity with those all throughout the human story. And so when a young person today says, I dream of making my life be worth something, I want my life to be important and to matter, I want to make a contribution, that, that's, a, that's a, a, an aspiration that's common to all human beings. Yeah. And then as I said at the beginning of this, this is, when we say Emmanuel, that the word was made flesh, we believe that that's here. The Son of God takes on our humanity. <laughs> but he continued to take on the work of Joseph and continue the family business. But still in all, he felt that he was called to something different. He had a crucial choice. Does he move into that call and to something different or does he remain in the family business? And the choice that he made changed the course of the entire human history. Tomorrow, if I can.
Christian baptism that we know today actually has its roots in a ritual washing that comes from the ancient Jewish faith. In the case of Jesus, he underwent this ritual washing at the River Jordan by the itinerant preacher John the Baptist, to whom at the time Jesus was most likely a follower of. I'm Robert Fiducia, and I met up with musician Steve Angersano, theology student Louisa Court, and Father Chris, seminary director in Australia, and we investigated why this immersion in water and faith means so much to the Christian people. I was asked one time to do a close my eyes and imagine this moment when Jesus got into the water. Oh, really? Yeah, it oh. was my first the first time I'd ever done any kind of thing like that. Like close yeah, your eyes, I'll read the story. Thing. Yeah, yeah okay. and you imagine imagine yourself in the story, the sights, the sounds. I didn't yeah. imagine the flies, okay? <laughs> but, but I imagined the the water and and John in the water and and I imagined myself in line. Mm. Mm. And and there are people being baptized yeah. and I'm and I want to be baptized by John. Okay, so this is the Jordan River, right? It's, you know, the border between Israel and Jordan. And it's a really long river, yeah? It runs pretty much the whole length of Israel. So why do we think that this is the spot that Jesus is baptized? Well, there's a couple of contenders for the baptism site. Okay. So you've got to know that there are a few places where they say this is where Jesus was baptized in the Jordan by right. John. This site is probably the most likely, though, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that we know that... John was raised in the um, in the Judean hill country. This is kind of closer to mm -hmm. that, um, but it's out in it's still out in the desert. It's mm -hmm. still out um, in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. um, but then also from pretty early on, we've got people saying this was the site. And again, we're talking about the memory of those first followers of Jesus yeah. being able to say, well, some of them may say, well, we were there. Let me let me show you where it was. So. That's cool. Mm -hmm. So it's not a conclusive tradition, but it's a strong tradition. Let, let's let's talk about because it's it's John the Baptist ministry. So what what was he doing, and why why here? Why in this area was he doing? It? So what was he doing, and why here? Yep. Mm. So you got to remember that John, as probably a young man, comes out into the Judean desert um, because he experiences a sense of call from God. And you know, we, there's speculation about whether he joined a particular community out here yeah. or not of, of people who were dedicated to that kind of life. Yeah. But when he comes out here, um, what he's really doing, and particularly when he starts to baptize people in the Jordan, is he's allowing this to be a, a moment of symbolic return into the kingdom, into the, the promised land. Mm. So when the Israelites first came here, they entered the promised land by crossing the Jordan. Right, right. And so what, what John's saying here is, we need to do a, a symbolic reenactment of that, which particularly involves repentance. Okay. So the idea is that people will be purified, they'll they'll repent, and as a, as a consequence, will be worthy yeah. to help bring about a new kingdom. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, cool. This this might very well be my favorite reading, the reading from Mark uh, about the baptism of Jesus. Now, it's not that we believe that baptism made him the son. He, he always, right. before time, he was the son. But it, the full, a fuller revelation of what it meant to be the son of God was given at that time. And then again at the transfiguration, and he hears that, you are my beloved, you are my beloved son, with whom I'm well pleased. And whenever I talk to kids about baptism, I use this reading because I, I want to express that it's not, it's not only the forgiveness of sins, which it is, but it makes us adopted daughters and sons so that when we're baptized, God says that over us. Right. You are my beloved, and I'm well pleased with you. So I, here's my question to you, my friend, is when have you felt that? When have you felt that, that you were God's son, the adopted son of God? You know, when you ask me that, Robert, the, the first thing I think of is that I have an adopted yeah. son. And uh, it's, it's just impossible to describe that experience. Uh, I, I, I was in the nursery. I was the first person to feed him. And it, it was extraordinary. And I'm holding this child in my arms. And, you know, I mean this with the greatest respect to my two natural born children. Yeah. But I... In that moment, I think I felt more responsibility to love this child than, than the others. Yeah, I mean, he truly had been given to us. And, yeah. and with this implication, please take care of this child, you know. And, mm. uh, and 
there's the love that I have for him. It's just uh, unbelievable. That, um, that flows out of the, the Kingdom of Israel and that mind, the mindset of the people at the time. The other part of that, I think, is that the ritual washing was a really important part of Jewish culture and ritual. And so this is an extension of that. It's taking it a little bit further for a full immersion. That's what the word baptism means. Yeah. And the idea was that I'm being washed, I'm being cleansed. But the Jews had all sorts of other smaller scale ritual washings. Okay. Yeah. So Christianity borrowed that particularly because Jesus was baptized. Yeah, okay. right here. All right, oh, now, cool. so it was ritual washing, repentance, but and certainly as Christians, and biblically speaking, we, we believe that that's part of it, but biblically speaking, it doesn't seem like that is the totality of what baptism is, just a, a ritual washing away of sin. There, there's, there's more to it. It's one of those moments where a ritual has been taken and then given a decisively new meaning yeah. because of Jesus. Yeah. So one of the things you've got to realize is that there was a real dilemma about why would Jesus be baptized? Yeah, there's right. that conviction. Yeah. There's that Everyone. conviction of the earliest Christians that they, that Jesus was sinless. Yeah. And so if, right. if this is for the forgiveness of sins, why does Jesus need to be baptized? Yeah, of course. When Jesus is asked that by John, John says, "You should be, you, know, you should be baptizing yeah. me." Right. You know, the other way around. Jesus says, let, let this be as righteousness demands. Mm -hmm. He is the sinless one, but he's entering into our human condition and he's saying, I'm identifying with you. I'm in deep solidarity with you. And so I'm gonna enter into this moment. Uh, beautiful, beautiful moment. Yeah. You can see how important the baptism is to the Christian faith, regardless if you take the following as metaphor or literal truth. So Jesus had this profound moment where that full revelation came and, and then just biblically speaking, we'll see it again at the Mount of Transfiguration, again the revelation of some, but he had this profound moment where he came into a deeper understanding of it. And I think for me, I've always expected that kind of like lightning bolt theophany, like the God has revealed himself. But how I see it is I feel like a son, very much like my dad, like through time. And sometimes when I pray, I feel like God grabs my hand and we walk through my personal history. And I see at all these different junctions, I could have gone left, but I went right. And if I had not have gone right, then this great event would not have happened. And it's out of my control. And I see God is in control and it's out of his love for me as his son. So it's not in this huge moment, but it's in my history that God reveals himself and says, I have adopted you in yeah. my son Jesus and you're my yeah. beloved and I'm well pleased with you because I don't deserve it right now we were talking about that driving here don't deserve it but yeah. the gift of being a son you know I think sometimes people interpret the, the passage in scripture that says all things work together for good to those who love yes, the Lord right. I think yes. they interpret that sometimes to mean so if I love God good things will always happen yeah. and that is so not what it says you know it says you know all things will work together for good in the in the end for those who love the Lord it means things that don't look when you look at that and you go how is this possibly going to turn out uh, uh, God has a way and in my own life in the in the good and the bad times there's just been a the experience of of just what you described, looking back and going, if that had not happened, I would never be where I am right now. The idea here is that heaven, it's a, it's a moment of revelation, heaven has been yeah. opened and there's access to, yes. to God. Yeah. Yes. And from those heavens, the, 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 there's a voice that says, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Mm. And oh, that's cool. for some, in one of the gospels, in Matthew's gospel, that's a, that's a proclamation to everybody who's there. That's right. But in Mark's gospel, it's actually a, a moment where the father, Jesus's father, God is saying that to Jesus. Yes. And so at that moment, I think, Jesus is getting a deep, deep confirmation of his identity. Yeah. That he is the beloved son. Yeah. The beloved son. It's beautiful. Yeah. And the final part of that is that from this moment, 
he's going to go out into the Judean wilderness for a while for, to pray. From that moment, launches his ministry. Yeah. He, he, he goes. He's, he goes into mission. Yeah. So the way I, the way I understand this is that his ide- identity is deeply confirmed here. He is the unique son of God, yeah. wow. deeply beloved by the Father, and because he's that, he's got a job to do. Yeah. He's got a, he's got a mission, and so this is the moment where he goes from being. Uh, the son of the the carpenter, the son of the tecton in Nazareth, yeah. to the itinerant preacher who goes up into Galilee preaching and teaching, and and doing miracles of healing and deliverance, um, walking on the water and all those other moments. Yeah. Mm. All yeah. that comes from this moment as yeah. is confirmed in who he is as the beloved son of God. Yeah, and I, I think that can kind of get lost that that it's just something that he did, but it's not just a a, a nice act that it really does it he, he explodes out from here so to speak right. yeah. and launches into a new identity a new min- ministry and it makes me wonder like is that the hidden life isn't recorded because this is where his full identity gets revealed yeah. in these waters and now that's where for us the revelation of his salvific work happens flowing from these waters there's no question that this is a decisive yeah. moment it launches him into into ministry and it's the result of a particular encounter that he has with god yeah no doubt about it yeah awesome thank you oh that's cool all right are you ready to jump in <laughs> i'm not sure i'm going to put my hand on <laughs> So Jesus comes up from the water in the river Jordan and the sky opens up and the spirit descends on him like a dove and it is revealed more fully, you are my beloved son and with you I am well pleased. So then he's taken and he is driven out to the desert and it's a very interesting verb that's used, driven out. It, it's very violent actually. It's like taking a cat by the scruff of the neck and slinging it outside. So he comes out to this harsh environment. And for 40 days, he's tempted by Satan to give up his ministry, to give up his identity, but he doesn't. He emerges from the desert and he decides that he wants to begin his ministry in a place where there are simple farmers, people who need to hear the good news of hope that the kingdom of God is here. And for that, he goes to Galilee and begins his work. So into the Judean desert, when he emerges out, it's time for him to begin his ministry. He could have chosen a thousand places to start his ministry, but he did it here at Galilee. He began to teach and began to have miracles. And then walking along these very shores, he begins to call apostles. He just says, follow me. So they begin to follow him. And they go all around the region, preaching and teaching and doing miracles. And the apostles are getting excited, asking who could this be? Could he be the one? This is the town of Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee. It's the location where Jesus preached as a rabbi through most of his ministry. The largest estimate is that it had a population of a thousand. It is a place where there's a Roman garrison and a tax house where they could exact taxes. Because from here, fish were sold all over the Middle East. I'm Robert Fiducia, and I brought along with me Father Chris Ryan, a seminary director in Australia, and theology student Louisa Court to explore the ruins of Capernaum. So 
So after Jesus is baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist, he goes out into the desert for 40 days. We know that from the scriptures. And after that, he's got something to share. He wants to preach and to teach and to tell people about his relationship with God as father. So he doesn't go to a big city. He doesn't go to a big city like Tiberias. He comes to a little fishing town called Capernaum. Okay, so Father Chris, what are we looking at here? What's, what's this? Okay, well, I'm really excited to show you this. Above us is a 20th century church. Right. So built underneath it, you can see a couple of outer walls in the shape of an octagon, yeah. okay? That's a 5th century church, okay? okay? The outer one. The outer yeah, one right. and, and the inner ring that's an octagon as well. Okay. That's, a, that's a 5th century church, cool. okay? okay? But the archaeologists have gone down to another layer uh -huh. and what they found is a 4th century, what we call a, a domus ecclesia, okay. a house church, oh. which oh, wow. happened all over the, that time in the 4th century. So after Constantine's peace, you have all these little places where Christians worship, where they basically convert a house. And so oh, okay. hence the sense of right. house church. Yeah. yeah. But underneath that level of archaeology, we've got a first century house. Hmm. And that first century house is um, not a very big room at all, not a very big space. Up until the, the, the middle of the first century, there's all sorts of normal household things that you find. So okay. all the signs that people live there. Yeah. From the mid first century though, something changes. No longer do you have those, all those household sort of things, yeah. or you can find a lamps mm -hmm. and storage jars, which should suggest, and in fact shows, that it was converted into a place for prayer, for, for worship. Okay. Right, okay. So the other thing that they did was they painted the walls. Capernaum is a town built of basalt, that right. dark rock. Yeah, yeah, I see that. But you can see here that they, these these aren't dark. They've been painted. Okay? Yeah. yeah. Underneath, you can yeah. kind of see. They've yeah. been whitewashed. Yeah. So people in the first century scribbled on that whitewash and they scribbled things like Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. Jesus is Lord. And there's even another piece that suggests Peter. So we are sure that this is Peter's house. St. Peter lived here in Capernaum. Right. This was his home. This is where he lived. This is where when Jesus decides to move to Capernaum right. to start his ministry, yeah. he says, I'm going to make a base here. Peter, can I move in with you? Oh, my god! So gosh. what I want to really stress <laughs> here is Jesus was in the house. <laughs> and in fact, in Mark's gospel, there are times where we talk about his home. Yes. Right? Yeah. Jesus is home. Yeah. Right. That's here. Well, that, oh that, that struck me when I was reading the gospel, just preparing here, because I was, you think of Jesus as being homeless. He didn't yeah, have any place that he lived. How you think of but it. Mark's gospel has it a lot of times, and he went home, and he went home, and in his house. So, like, like so this was the place where they, they ripped the roof off and lowered the, the paralytic man down? So this, this was it? This is, oh the, my gosh. this is the site of many of Jesus' <laughs> miracles. Oh, my gosh. So, as, as you said, Robert, this is the moment where the, the crowd gathers because yeah. they've Peter, Jesus has already just healed Peter's mother-in-law. Yeah. Right, the the yeah. reputation is growing. People are gathering. Yeah. Big crowd. Nobody can get in. So these four friends take their sick buddy and they, they, when they can't get in the front door, they open up the roof, right. which would have been oh, wow. mud and thatch. And they rip open the roof to lower him down. Well, right that, there. That happened right oh there. Oh, my God. <laughs> that happened right there. Oh, my God. For those that don't know, Peter was a fisherman who, after Jesus' death, went on to become the leader of the disciples. And because of this, he is recognized as the first pope of the Roman Catholic Church. Why did Peter move from Bethsaida over there to here? Well, one of the reasons I think is that he, um, it, it makes, well, maybe, maybe he fell in love with the girl from here. And yeah, that's why, that's why his mother-in-law is here. Yeah, maybe that's part of it. Yeah, sure. There's probably an economic reason. Yeah. Um, he's close to the water as a fisherman. He only has to pay taxes once here too. If he's from Bethsaida, yeah. um, his fish get taxed twice. And so he's, oh, yeah. it's oh, econo yeah. economically it makes, makes sense, sense for him to move yeah. here as well. I mean, the yeah. inter an interesting question here I think is why did Jesus choose Capernaum? Yeah. Um, Tiberius is just down the road. It's a much bigger city. Why did Jesus pick here? And maybe it's the first place where he got a receptive audience where people actually drew attention to what he was. That's a possibility. Yeah. We don't know. Another possibility might be that 
you know, he calls those first disciples and that's, this is where they live and so this is where he sets up. Yeah. Um, but I, I, it yeah. seems like you can see like what a house is, like that, that 99 and 100. Mm. So it looks like there, there are two rooms. Yeah. One room is for sleeping in and the other room is for everything else. Jesus was a radical preacher, but he may have been best known in that time period as a healer. And there were two things that separated Jesus from other healers of the day. First, others would charge a premium rate. Jesus administered for free, especially to the poor and the marginalized. And then second, others would require for the afflicted to go home and use complex rituals. Whereas Jesus gained the reputation to heal on the spot and without ceremony. There were certainly other people who claimed to be healers and who, you know, ostensibly achieved those healings. One of the big differences is that they had complicated kind of prayers and rituals that you had to go through. Whereas Jesus simply would touch somebody and say, be healed, and they were healed. Or he'd say, um, of course I want to heal you, and they would be healed. Uh, he's, sometimes there are stories of just people touching him and he was healed. So you've got a really dramatic, dif dramatically different kind of healer. He's not somebody who says, go away and, s and say these ritual in incantations or pray these certain words. He's saying, I heal you. So I want, want you to think about Capernaum as being the real base of Jesus' yeah. ministry. Yeah, yeah. Okay? which you don't yeah. really realise until no. we, you come here and yeah. figure it all out. Yeah. In a moment we might go up to the synagogue, which yeah. is over this way. Right. Jesus went up there, that's where he heals a man with a withered hand. It's where a, a, somebody who's really oppressed by evil is freed by Jesus from that oppression. Um, here in the town of Capernaum, he calls Levi or, or Matthew. Yeah, yeah. Right. right. Matthew was the custom, he worked in the customs house here in Capernaum. So. Jesus uses this as the base of his operation, but it's also really, in a lot of ways, the center of his ministry yeah. Yeah. while he's here in Galilee. And, and you get that sense being here that, that he could make day trips. You know, like, like we mm. ate lunch in Magdala, for example, where Mary yeah, Magdala yeah, was from, yeah. but he could go there, 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 cross over, and then come home. Yeah. Like, like go like preach in another yeah. village for the day and then okay. come oh here. Oh my God. <laughs> it's just mind blowing. It is mind blowing. It's ridiculous. Oh my gosh. Wow. That's cool. This is cool. It is really, this really is cool. Yeah. This is cool. And I love, I love the sense that people have gathered here to pray and they've said, this is the place. Yeah. You know? So wh wh where else would you go? If, if, you're, if you're those early followers of Jesus after his resurrection in this part of the world, in where Galilee, go? you go where Jesus was and you oh pray gosh. there. So that's what they did. And we get to stand here now. One of the really exciting things about this space too and this church above us yeah. is that when they built this church, they left a big hole in the middle and put some glass in the floor so you can actually look oh, right down, no. oh, can you really? straight okay, down at Peter's house. Oh, can we do that? Let's do that. All right, we got to go do that. And Jesus says, what are you hearing? As you're out there, as you're talking to people, what are people saying about me? And one of them may pipe up and say, well, some think you're John the Baptist who's, uh, who's returned again. Maybe they talk about that and discuss what that would mean. A little bit later, somebody else says, well, I've heard people speculate that you're the prophet Elijah. And they scratch their heads. They talk about that. What could that mean? And then there's a long pause. Perhaps Jesus is just poking at the fire. And then he says, what about you? What do you think about me? Peter looks up, perhaps he looks Jesus right in the eye, and he says, you're the one. I think you're the Messiah. I think you're the anointed one. I think you're the one that we've been waiting for. Wherever Jesus goes, he creates a fuss, he makes a mess. And so when he's releasing people from evil oppression, when he's healing people, in each of those moments, what he's, um, he's making enemies. People are saying, you can't do that here. You can't do it on the Sabbath day. You can't do that um, at a time, you know, in this place where we are, this holy place. So it definitely created a fuss. 
And the other thing we need to know about this is that while Capernaum was his base and while he had a following here, evidenced by the church and the people who obviously clearly remembered him after his death and resurrection and, and prayed here, many people in Capernaum rejected him. And we know that, that in the scriptures he eventually said, um, Capernaum, you didn't believe in me. And he's sad about that. So you have people who said yes to him and followed him, and you also have people who said, no, I'm not interested. Jesus throws a stick in the fire and he says, get ready because we're going to Jerusalem. The apostles that night were probably talking about that he's the one and they're going to go into Jerusalem to overtake the, the government because they were being occupied by, by the Roman authority at that time. The Roman Empire was here and they thought he was going to overthrow the government and that he was going to be raised up as the new leader. Jesus goes to Jerusalem to take his place as king, but it is not at all what the apostles were expecting. Okay, so I really wanted to come down here. I've been loving hanging out around this region uh, today and just seeing how still it is. Look how just like calm and, yeah. and like peaceful and yeah. flat it is. I just, I just love it. And I can imagine that it, it would have been just kind of like this uh, right after Jesus calmed the storm, right? And that story we have in the gospels, I can imagine it being just this kind of still, mm -hmm. peaceful, yeah. um, beautiful scene. Yeah. It's just, I mean, why do you think, why do you think they chose to include that story in the Gospels? I'm sure Jesus did more miracles than, than we can imagine, yeah. let alone what's actually written down. Yeah. Why, why, do, why do you think they chose to, to put this one in? Well, I think that the Gospel authors have a lot they want to say about it, but I think to set that up for you, I mean, it's hard to imagine that there could be a storm on a day like yeah, today. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I've think, been thinking how that. Could, how could the waves ever get so high? How could the disciples really be worried? Yeah. Um, but really what's going on here is that they've, um, you know, it's possible for there to be a big storm brew up here. Mm. So just the nature of the, the hills around oh, us, right. when the wind picked up and a storm kicked in, yeah. um, it could really set the waves Cause going. Because oh. this being low, the change of temperature could right. kick it in. Yeah. Exactly. Oh. So there's like a wind tunnel kind of high, Well, a high pressure, low pressure. Yeah. The wind yeah. comes through and all of a sudden it's kind of scary. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but to really understand what's going on here, I think you've, Let's, let me just sort of paint the picture for you. So yeah. the disciples are out on a boat. Jesus is in the boat. Um, but according to the story, he's asleep. There's a nice little detail where he's even on a cushion. <laughs> he's, so he's reclining back, yeah. he's asleep. So he's he tired, he's been busy, yeah. he's been doing all the things he's been doing. He works pretty hard. He's, he's out on the, he's out, they're out on the sea and the storm picks up. And these are, these are competent fishermen, I want to stress right. that too. Yeah. These, yeah. It's not like the first storm they've ever seen, yeah. right. but they're scared. And part of, part of that, I think, is you know, something that is bigger than them. In, the, in their mindset too, the sea, the ocean, yeah. was actually a place that was scary. Mm, right. um, it yeah. was a symbol of dying, of death, of chaos. Yeah. Um, it was yeah. a place where sea monsters lived. You know, it was a dangerous place. And while these are really competent men at what they do, they're at the mercy of the weather. Yeah. Mm. Um, so this is something bigger than them that's threatening to overwhelm them. Yeah. And, and they're scared. And so they, they wake him up and he, um, he looks, at the, looks at them and he actually challenges them and says, don't you have faith that I'm in mm. charge here? Don't you understand that I'm in control? And he says, be quiet. And in that moment, he's, he's really taking authority over all the forces yeah. that they believed that were conspiring against them mm. to bring about yeah, the storm. Yeah. It's, like, it's like Jesus is saying, I've got power over the chaos. Yeah. I've got power over your fears mm, mm. and all of a sudden it, it's quiet and we're back to this kind of wow. this pond this quiet peaceful yeah. water yeah. So beautiful. it 
it's an amazing story because it, it shows us Jesus's power. Yeah. That he's he's got this incredible ability to even control the, the forces of nature. Yeah. And I guess in the 21st century, that can be sometimes hard for us to believe. Right, right. We sort of say to ourselves, well, I've never seen that happen, so it can't be true. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. But I think the thing that we need to remember in that is that Jesus isn't just anybody. No. So if we believe that he was born of a virgin, if we believe that he rose from the dead, if we believe that he's son of God, uh, then why wouldn't he have power over that which he has created? And I think that's really important for us to understand. Yeah. This is about him being in charge. Yeah. Well, and, and I'm struck that they, they, they ask the question, it, it kind of runs through the Gospels, where they, they say, who could this be right. yeah. that even the winds and the waves obey him? Yeah. I love that question. And that, of course, that gets revealed later on. Mm. But it, it, it demonstrates a question about who he is, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the great questions in the gospel story is who really is yeah, this guy, yeah, right? right? Who is he What's really? Who yeah. is he really? And and ultimately it will be that he is the son of God. Mm. But this story helps set that up. It helps yeah. explain to us that he, he is the one who has authority yeah. over over all that that exists. I, I think, and I think for us, you know, there's something really important there for us that in our lives, we find ourselves kind of asking those questions. Who's in charge? Hmm. We find ourselves feeling like the water's about to go into the boat, that we're going to drown. Yeah. And all sorts of circumstances can make that happen or make us feel like that's going to be the case. Yeah. Really important for us at those moments to say, well, I actually believe you're in charge of the boat. Yeah. And the other part of that too is, you know, the, the notice, the little note that he's asleep. And we can sometimes feel like Jesus is asleep with yeah. us, you know, that he doesn't seem like he's totally. helping yeah. us out. Totally. He doesn't seem like he's going to be there for us. But then the moment when we ask him and say, look, I need you and I, I'm feeling overwhelmed or I'm feeling scared, to ask him you know, to calm the storm in our lives. Mm. I think that's a really important part of this story and what it means for us. So after a several days journey from up north down to Jerusalem, the city comes in sight. The apostles are wide-eyed, looking at the sights of the city, hearing the sounds, smelling the smells, the spices, the street food being cooked. But they don't notice that Jesus seems oblivious to all of the sights and sounds. And he's surveying the surroundings, particularly he's surveying the temple. Louisa, just tell me, what does it I mean? What does it feel like to to be here at the at the Zion Gate, the entrance into Jerusalem? It's so surreal. It's yeah. just absolutely crazy to, to kind of understand that, that he came here. Yeah. Um, I think we're getting an idea of the distance now of how far he came really yeah. out of the countryside into the city and what that what that would have meant yeah. for him too. Um, but it's just, you know, as a pilgrim, it's, it's quite crazy to understand and to, to think about. But, um, yeah, so what do you know, think he felt as he came through that gate and into here? I think he would have... It feels very final, you know, you can see how big these how big this, this gate is and how yeah. um, official it is, you know? It's very official, very final. I think he would have, walking into it, it would have been almost like you have to yeah. take a step back, take a breath and be like, okay, this is what's gonna happen. Yeah. And, and then walk on in, knowing what he was gonna face um, yeah. and if he was ever gonna come out. The sun comes up and they make their way into the city. 
They go to the temple district, and Jesus commits the crime. He does the wrong thing at the wrong place at the wrong time. He goes into the temple and takes the whip and begins to drive out all of the money changers. He takes their tables and flings them in the air and creates a great disturbance, the wrong thing, at the holiest place in all of Judaism, at the temple. And he does it at the wrong time during the Feast of Passover. The religious leaders look at this and see this man is no longer just a blasphemer or just a nuisance. He's a danger and he's a real threat. And they say this man has to be stopped. But it wasn't just the religious leaders that were upset. Some of the apostles were shaken and one was shaken to his very core. And he too said, this man must be stopped. So he goes to the religious leaders and he says, if you want him, I can get him for you. This is the epicenter of the beginning of Christianity. Right. So if you would just describe like what, what this is right now. This is, we're, we're on the hill that in modern times is called, and since the Middle Ages has been called Mount Zion, yeah. uh, the, on the western hill of Jerusalem. And uh, in this area, in this general area, yeah. the first Christian community grew up. The community, the Acts of the Apostles. We believe that somewhere in this space near is the was the upper room where the disciples were gathered. From ancient from the ancient church until this present time, Mount Zion has always been sacred, very sacred, yeah, to yeah. the to the uh, uh, to the Christian community. Wow. Okay, so where are we going to go first? What's our first stop okay. as we look at the night of the betrayal? Okay, we're going to go to the upper room, okay. and in the upper room we'll talk about the Last Supper and the mm -hmm. uh, and the, the betrayal of Jesus. And what is it called? The, the Chinalium, is that right? The Cenaculum. 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 I'm trying to make it Italian, I'm sorry. The Cenaculum. <laughs> the dining room. <laughs> the dining room. Yes. Crusaders in the Middle Ages uh, built this medieval room uh, to commemorate that space. We don't know that it happened here, that it happened in another place, but also because the, in the scriptures and the Acts of the Apostles were told the disciples gathered in an upper room after the resurrection, they were gathered in an upper room for the, uh, for the, the, the Passover supper, they were in an upper room. And so it sort of gets conflated into a single space to commemorate all of those things. So walk us through the events of the day then, you know, give us from the start, what happened? On that day, of course, it's the beginning of the Passover festival. Pilgrims have come from all over, uh, Jewish pilgrims have come from all over to celebrate the Passover. And Jesus' disciples are asked by, uh, Jesus asked him where does he want them to prepare the Passover. He gives them instructions to come into the city to find a particular man. That man will lead him to an upper room and there he will celebrate the Passover with his disciples. And so, Somewhere in this area, perhaps, uh, was the place where Jesus and his disciples gathered for that last Passover. And so that evening, they gathered for the meal. There is the scriptures give us, both in St. Paul and in the Synoptic Gospels, the narrative of Jesus sharing that Passover with his disciples, his prediction of his betrayal by Judas, um, his, uh, his breaking of bread and wine and giving new meaning, uh, connected not just to the ancient covenant, but to the new covenant as well. After the sharing of that Passover meal with his disciples, after the, the reinterpretation of the Passover meal in relationship to what he was going to do, the new sacrifice of the new covenant, uh, after, his, um, after his giving of the new commandment of love and demonstrating it by the washing of feet, he then invites his disciples to go with him uh, to another place, and they go from this place, from this hill, across the Tyaporian Valley, across the Kidron Valley, uh, and, uh, and there pray in the Garden of Gethsemane.
You know, I, I think about what, what Jesus really faced. I mean, it was, it's often said that if you want to see his humanity, you look at what happened at the garden. Um, but I, I look at, at, at his humanity in terms of freedom and choice. You know, that, that's something that is so fundamental to our humanity that we have freedom. And, but, but I think about him being able to look over the city and look down onto this valley road right here. And he could have run. It would have been very easy for him to drop down into the valley, to see them coming from that direction, to drop down here and to go that way and he would have never been caught, you know? But, but he had the decision, and, and he made the decision to give himself over to, to the Father's will. Yeah, yeah I, think, um, I think we have this moment, don't we, where Jesus makes a decision that he's going to be faithful to his Father right to the very end. And it's a really clear choice. This, uh, this walkway really stimulates my imagination because I, I, I do, I imagine Jesus walking as we are past these graves. And the number of times on the night of the betrayal he went back and forth, and just stunning. Yeah. I think, I mean, death was much more part of life in Jesus' time in lots of ways, but it can't have been anything other than ominous, can it? That as he knows what's about to happen and then as it actually happens, he's walking through these tombs. And he must have been thinking, uh, well, this is where it's come to. This is what it's all amounted to right here. Yeah. Yeah. They, they talk about this in the Gospels. We, we know this. We think of this time as the agony in the garden. We right. call it the yeah. agony, the agony in the garden. So what can you help us understand, I suppose, what that would have been like for Jesus, both physically and psychologically, of course? Yeah, it's a, that's a good question. I think that... Uh, Again, Jesus' own knowledge of what's coming, he's been telling his disciples for weeks in their yeah. preparation to come to Jerusalem. I'm going to Jerusalem to die. And uh, you remember uh, St. Thomas says, let's go with him. We'll go die with him, okay? And, yeah. and, and so the, the disciples know. And, and so he knows what's coming. He knows what's yeah. ahead. And as a human being, as a man, he has to grapple with this reality that in obedience to the Father, he's come to live the full, of, uh, the full human existence. And part of that human existence is to die. And so knowing and, and seeing the opposition building over that time and seeing uh, the, the threats that are coming from the authorities of the time, uh, he, he, he has this moment where he asks the Father for the cup to pass from him. He, yeah. He says, is there any other way we can do this? Yeah. Is there some other way this could be accomplished? Uh, St. Luke tells us that his, the agony was so intense, the, the moment was so intense for him that his sweat became like blood. Yeah. Um, the psychological and physical reality of, of, uh, the, impending, uh, of the impending death is so intense but something happens in a moment where Jesus becomes reconciled to it. Not my will, but your will, Father. I want this cup to pass from me, but if I have to drink from this cup, Father, I'm completely obedient to who you called me, who you sent me to be. I'm completely obedient to you. And even in the midst of the agony, Jesus can Jesus can say, okay, I'm ready to go through with this. I'm ready to go through with this. After that, Jesus goes away, prepares the Passover, and they celebrate the Passover. The one leaves early. They make their way through the valley. They go down into the, from the hills into the valley and make their way up to a garden that Jesus liked to pray. He told the apostles, stay here, and then he took three others with him and went to a separate area. And those three were urged to pray while he went somewhere else. He said, please stay awake and pray, but they fell asleep. Jesus is by himself. And intently he prays to his father. 
and he says, let this not happen to me. Please don't let this happen. But not what I want, but what you want. At that moment, he looks down into the valley, and he sees the soldiers coming, and he knows by the walk who's leading them. It was Judas, one of his best friends. They're not there yet. The others are asleep. He could have dropped down into the valley and run and just gone away and started a whole new life where all of this was all forgotten. But he stayed. He was arrested and he was betrayed, not by a handshake, not by there he is, but by a kiss. The soldiers take him to the high priest and it is there that we have the beginning of the greatest and most famous persecution, torture, and execution in human history. One who was not only betrayed, but he was denied by his best friends. And he waited alone for the deed to happen, for him to be killed. So as the apostles were making their way to Jerusalem, they began to talk among themselves about who would have what role in the kingdom. Because they knew Israel was about to be restored. The occupation by the Romans was going to be over as the kingdom of Israel rose up with Jesus as the king and the 12 of them serving in his court, not for their own sake, but for the restoration of the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. Now, this is odd, but um, I, I like he has a Palestinian nose. <laughs> I really do. I, I, I like that, that he looks, he doesn't look like a, you know, a, a, a Western man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he, he's, he's got that Palestinian nose. Yeah, just artistically, what is it about like this particular cross that, um, that hits you? I, I kind of like... Um, the simplicity of the, of the word, but more importantly, yeah. I think, the look on his face, you know, mm -hmm. you can kind of see he looks, he looks sad, he looks, you know, yeah, mournful a bit, mm -hmm. yeah. How many crosses do you think you've seen? I've become almost numb to the image, but then I remember what it symbolizes. Torture, humiliation, sacrifice, love. It is a sacred symbol in the Christian faith. I'm not certain how many people actually know the crime that he was punished for. I'm Robert Fiducia, and while in Jerusalem, theology student Louisa Cord and I spoke with Father Bart Hutcherson in order to learn more. Before we get into the crucifixion, I want to kind of set the scene because I, I don't think many Christians know what was the crime. So I wanted to return to talk about the scene of the crime. I heard it said that Jesus did the wrong thing at the wrong place at the wrong time. Could you just say about, okay. describe what happened? So I would say simply, yes, Jesus did the wrong thing, the wrong time, the wrong place. He did that consistently through his ministry, though. Mm. If you mm. read Ma mm. if you read Mark's gospel, they're seeking to kill Jesus in the third chapter of Matthew of yeah, Mark's gospel. Right. The third chapter. Yeah. So yeah. it doesn't it, it does it doesn't have not because of something point. he yeah. did in Jerusalem, but you have to look at the totality of his ministry. Yeah. He builds the case over the course of his ministry in Galilee, the healing, the teaching, the restoration of sight, the um, the, the constant conflict with the religious authorities. He's building the case for his messianic ministry all the way. And, uh, and so, uh, so the crime, as I said, at Caiaphas's house, the crime that Jesus is charged with 
in, uh, by the Jewish authorities as blasphemy. He has made himself equal to God. Mm -hmm. He has, he's not answered correctly when they ask him, are you the son of God? Are you the Messiah? Mm -hmm. Are you the Holy One? He's not answered that question correctly. This has been a speculation that's been going on about Jesus through his entire ministry. Yeah. And when given the opportunity to answer the question himself, he gives what the Jewish authorities say are the wrong answer. And so that's one thing we have to look at from the standpoint of the Jewish authorities. Jesus has committed a blasphemy by making himself equal to the Father, yeah. making himself the son of the Father, making himself by, by proclaiming to be the, the awaited Messiah. Before exploring the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, we wanted to learn more about Jesus' journey. So Louisa and I sat down with Father Bard at the ancient steps that led to the Jewish high priest's palace. So he would have come from the Mount of Olives down into the valley, but then these steps would have led to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest, in the first trial. So he could have walked, it's very likely he walked these steps. We, what we, what we can say about these steps is that they were definitely here at the time of Jesus. And yes, as you've just described it, coming from the Mount of Olives across the Kidron Valley to the house of the high priest, which was in this precinct. We're at the church of St. Peter and Galicantu right now. But the, the house of Caiaphas was known to be in this area. This was where the high priest lived. There was direct access from this precinct to the Temple Mount. Uh, and so, uh, so if Jesus was brought to the high priest's house, as the scripture says, it's likely he would have come this way. And so, uh, and so these are remembered, but, but really the significance is not necessarily that Jesus walked on them. So much, of, so much of the history of the city of Jerusalem is layer upon layer upon layer. Here, we're on the layer of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus, yeah. this was here when Jesus was here. And, uh, um, uh, and so, yes, was there some possibility he came this way? Yes, there's a possibility he came this way. Uh, but this is where we remember the path, uh, this is where we observe or commemorate the path going to that, uh, that, that trial by the high priest. Undoubtedly, Jesus was a hugely impactful historical figure. So why exactly were so many people upset with him and upset by him? That we've already we've already seen in the Gospels prior to his coming to Jerusalem. They're they're already out to get him from the beginning. He mm -hmm. he's he's dangerous. He's dangerous in many ways. He he subverts the he subverts the established order. He's outside their the power structure. He's outside um, outside the uh, uh, the way things are supposed to be for a yeah. good religious Jew. Yeah. Uh, and yet he's such a faithful. Uh, Jew, Jew of the Second Temple, yeah. he, the Second Temple era, and 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 is simply trying to live into that himself. But but when brought before um, when brought before the the high priest, there's two two focuses of the uh, of their questioning. Uh, are you the Messiah? Are mm -hmm. you the Son of God? Are you have you said these things? And and you said you would tear down the temple and build it up. Have you, do you, do you really offer it? Is there some threat that you really represent to the temple itself? The hour is coming now for him to reveal who he is. And so when asked, uh, uh, are, you, are you the son of God? He says, well, you say that I am. And that is the, the moment at which the high priest tears mm. his garment as a symbol, a symbol of, uh, yeah, that, that symbol of, of just, Agony, utter agony that that this you infuriated. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and you you've said you've given the wrong answer, and I'm going to I, this this tearing of the garment is the is the worst sign that you could show. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna uh, I, I, I I disown what you just said. It's so it's so loathsome to me. I'm gonna tear my garment in curse of what you've just said. And so so from the perspective of the high priest, from the perspective of the council, Jesus has committed the worst blasphemy. He's equated himself in some way with the power and goodness of God. He's related, him, he's, he's, he's equated himself some way with the, with the Father. And they just have no idea that he's right. <laughs> <laughs> that, he's, that he's not lying. You are jumping ahead of the story. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Yes, that's exactly right. No, that's exactly right. They have no idea who they're dealing with at that point. Yeah. And while it's easy for us to make the judgment that they, uh, they're simply guarding their power, they're guarding mm. 
the the order as it exists. They're also faithful Jews, yeah. Yeah, and, no. and they want they want got a to, truth to exactly, and yeah. and they they don't see how Jesus fits into that. Yeah. And so, uh, so it's a it, it's it's a difficult moment. Uh, looking at it as a, as a faithful Christian, two thousand years later, mm-hmm. I can say they didn't get it, but yeah. at that point. They, they don't have the equipment to get it. Absolutely. They also are fearful. The Romans have created so much fear. Mm. They come to Jerusalem and they walk around the city and they go outside the temple district, the place where God is worshiped. And they saw people doing what they are supposed to do, buy doves, buy animals in order to be sacrificed in the temple. But Jesus does something completely unexpected. He looks at it and he turns the tables over and causes a great ruckus in a holy place. No longer were they questioning, is he king? They began to question, is he crazy? But the other piece of it is the Roman piece, the fact that uh, that Jesus represents a threat to mm-hmm. the, the order that has been established um, as as uh, as precarious as that order is, as precarious as that peace is, you've got the temple, you've got sacrifices, you've got uh, you've got the religion of ancient Israel mm-hmm. happening with the blessing of Rome. And as long as everything's as long as everything's okay, as long as everything is peaceful, yeah. they're fine. And there have been a lot of messianic agitators during that yeah. time. But Jesus then comes into the comes into the city. He goes into the temple, and and the first thing he does in in his own presence in the temple is to say, "You've turned my father's house into a den of thieves, and this is supposed to be a house of prayer." And and so he begins to he begins to upset the order by literally upsetting the order by turning over yeah. the tables of the money changers. And so in John's gospel, especially, we begin to see that that the concern of the religious authorities is not so much the blasphemy as it is that Jesus is making everybody up that has the possibility of making everybody upset. Yeah. And, and so you hear uttered, you hear you hear it, the words uttered, better that this one man mm-hmm. be sacrificed, better this one man die than for the whole nation to die. Yeah. So how does Rome come to be involved? Pilate's response is one of fear. Pilate is scared of Jesus. He mm. uh, he's been affected by uh, by, by Jesus' not answering, by yeah. Jesus's, yeah, by, by Jesus's, when Jesus does answer, he gives good answers. He talks about yeah. truth. He talks about, yeah. uh, he talks about uh, uh, the, the power of God. And so Pilate's response is, is one of, well, uh, I don't find anything wrong with this guy. And, yeah. and he, declares, he, he declares Jesus innocent over and over and over again. But of course, the religious authorities, they want Jesus crucified. They want him executed. And so then the, the authorities decide that they, uh, the, the religious law doesn't work, so let's, let's talk about things that, that will matter to Herod. Yeah, right. This yeah. is a man who has made, himself a, uh, uh, has made himself an enemy of the Roman state. He's, he's declared himself to be the Messiah, which is a kind of king. So he's now someone, a pretender, who represents a threat to Roman authority. Mm. Uh, and so now Pilate's ears perk up. And so Pilate, um, at some point, Pilate feels he has no other course. Um, the, he, uh, he sentences Jesus to die, turns him over to the executioners, and then Jesus is, uh, the, the, at least the cross beam of his cross is placed on his back, and he is sent to Golgotha uh, down what we call the way of the cross. begins to act very erratically, and he speaks irreverently to the religious leaders. He's arrested, he's beaten, and the man that they thought was going to be king is now standing in complete humiliation. He's given a wooden beam, he's stripped of all of his garments, and he's made to be paraded through the city. They're watching this in complete shock. He gets laid down after being mercilessly whipped. Nails driven into his hands and into his feet. He's lifted up high. A spear is forced into his side and he dies. I 
And was it was it customary then? Was it usual for them to whip someone? A oh, absolutely, before absolutely. they were crucified. Yes, that was a uh, that was a typical part of of a Roman crucifixion. The crucifixion was was intended uh, as a very humiliating punishment. Yeah. The, the, the and so the more you could do to debase the person, to take yeah. away all of his dignity, and you would want to beat someone uh, so that they were weakened, but not so much that they were weakened to the point that they couldn't carry their own cross. Because oh, again, right. part of the humiliating process would be to parade this person through the streets carrying their cross. Mm. And uh, um, and they did so naked, is that, <laughs> is that right? They had, because we see the, the crucifix with the loincloth, but historically there's no evidence for that. Right, part of the part of the process, part of the humiliation, was to was to execute somebody naked, and it's, of course it's very public because they want they want to use this particular form of, of execution as a as a threat to those who would want to subvert the the, yeah. the, the Roman yeah. order. The whole idea would have been to would have been to get Jesus to the most crowded part of the city. Yeah. Very often in movies and so forth, it's depicted as though there are crowds on the side of the street watching, yeah. and maybe that's true, maybe it's not. Yeah. Um, but, uh, uh, but a market would have made sense. Sure. Well, uh, again, every street, in some sense, would have been a market. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, not through side streets, but through, not through side streets, but through uh, main streets. Yeah. So the streets sort of been built up. Oh, certainly, of course. Yeah. I mean, again, history is layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. Yeah. Yeah. This is it, and what I didn't know was that this is the place where he was both crucified and buried. So, so, both in the same place. so here we've, we're coming. We've come to the medieval facade of right. the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Okay. There has been a church honoring both the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus on this site since the fourth century. Uh, and so, for, so for now for 1,700 years, Christians have come to this site to remember uh, Jesus's. To remember Jesus' crucifixion. The stairs yeah. here are lead to a medieval chapel of the Franks. Yeah. Wow. And so when you climb up those stairs, and we, we can no longer enter that way, we enter through stairs on the inside, but you're climbing up onto the top of a rocky outcrop that is Golgotha. And it's unlikely that the little outcrop that's there, that Jesus was actually crucified in that exact space. But somewhere in a between here and, and several hundred meters in that direction, uh, you would have had you would have had the place of crucifixion uh, in the city in, in the city of Jerusalem, and then also contained within this building nearby, very close by, is the place where Jesus was buried as well. And so we'll go inside and see both of those things. Here and now we're here, and it's just so so real. And how do you? like the way it all fits into history is just absolutely wonderful. I think that's the that's the true uh, joy of coming to the Holy Land. Yeah. Uh, it brings the scriptures alive. When absolutely. I when I when I think in terms of Jesus coming from the Mount of Olives across the Kidron yeah. Valley to the to back to this hill, I have spatial understanding of that now that I didn't have before the yeah. first time I visited here. And every time I read that in the scriptures now it, it takes on a whole new life for me. Mm -hmm. They take him down from the cross, he's wrapped in linen, and he's laid in a tomb, a lifeless, dead body, drained of blood, laid in a tomb. I look at the cross and I, I think, just why? Why did he have to die? And then, why did he have to die so cruelly? I mean, we heard Father Bart describe crucifixion, you know, what it's like. So, wh why did he have to die and die such a horrible, 
painful, tragic death. When Jesus goes to the cross, he's entering into our story. He's taking on our experience of suffering and pain and guilt and fear and ultimately even death. Yeah. He's, he's entering into that. It's like we're giving him our experience. And in return, he gives us his experience. Mm. And his experience is the experience of the Father's love for us. And so I think it's really important that we understand that it was, it was for love that this happened. Yeah. And that Jesus was prepared. What he, what he came to do was to show us the love of his Father. And he was prepared to go and do whatever it took to go to whatever level he needed to go to in order to show it. And ultimately he realizes that means dying. That's of course not the end of the story. And it's important that we realize that, that in a sense the Father is saying when Jesus rises from the dead, that love conquers. Mm. even death yeah that love is absolute love is even greater than death yeah so i think that's the that's why really at the deepest level why the crucifixion happens mm. the stone gets rolled over and all of their dreams all of their hopes have been dashed they looked at one another now in embarrassment and shame they wondered, is this how it ends? Does it end with this great tragedy? The belief that Jesus rose from the dead is at the very root of the Christian faith. However, it is an event that cannot be proven, but rather must be believed. I'm Robert Fiducia, and while in Jerusalem, theology student Louisa Court and Father Chris Ryan, director of a seminary in Australia, sat down to speak more about the beginnings of their faith. One of the things that for me really matters is that when the first authors of what we now call the, the New Testament, when they were talking about it, they used a really particular word. Mm. You know, they, they had a word for hallucination. They had a word for ghost. Um, they probably had a word for we all sat together and had a really warm, fuzzy feeling and decided that he was alive in our <laughs> hearts. But that's yeah. not the word that those guys used. The word they used was anastasis, which means he got up, literally. It's what we now say when he, we say he rose. It means he got up. And I think um, they, they make it really clear. They rule out those alternative explanations. Jesus isn't a ghost because they can touch him. They make it really clear that the tomb is empty. So they're not just having a hallucinatory kind of experience mm. or a warm, fuzzy feeling. Um, they make it really clear in their encounters that they're actually meeting him, the one who had been crucified and is now So when Jesus died, it was late in the afternoon on a Friday. Now the Jewish Sabbath begins with sundown on Friday and it goes all the way to sundown on Saturday. So they had to hastily take the body down from the cross, anoint it, wrap it in linen, and bring it to the tomb. Now there have been rumors that Jesus was talking about rising from the dead after three days. So in order to prevent that, the Roman soldiers moved a giant boulder, a stone, in front of the tomb. The finality that the apostles felt at that moment, that this was it, it was over, as the seal went over the tomb, it was done.
Some people in popular writings have said that Jesus could not have risen from the dead because he was never even buried. These people point to the fact that the Romans left bodies on the crosses after crucifixion and never buried them. To learn more, I went to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the location where Jesus is believed to have been crucified and buried. While there, I met up with Father Bart Hutcherson, a Holy Land expert, and I asked this question of him. Was Jesus actually buried? In many places, the Romans did not bury the corpses of people that were crucified. They yeah. left them there as a sign, as a horror, as a horror image sign that this is what, you know, th this is what will happen to you if you, if you dare to challenge yeah. the power of Rome. Uh, and so they were literally left as carrion for wild birds. Uh, and then their bones might be collected and thrown into a pit somewhere. Mm. Okay, we don't have any evidence of a bone pit anywhere around here, mm. but, um, but also that happened in places that weren't Jerusalem. Yeah. The Jewish people, even though Jesus was a, was a criminal, in their minds, even though Jesus was condemned to die, he was still a Jew, a Jew and yeah. so he should be, and so he should be buried. On top of that, he was a rabbi who had followers, and so what the story in the scripture is that the followers of Jesus, the followers of Jesus, are the ones who come to who, who come to collect his body mm -hmm. and affect his burial to make to make sure that he's given the burial he deserves. And the concern is, of course, following Jewish law to get right. him buried before the Sabbath begins. Okay, so we believe this here to be the actual site of Jesus' burial and resurrection. And I mean, right. we know there's, there's other tombs here, but we believe this is the one. Why, why do we believe that? How do we know that? Okay, so first of all, I want you to imagine that this is not the Baroque building that's been yeah. built here. I want you to imagine it as a cave. And so the rock would have been, would have been, would have come out from the wall to this place. This would have been the sheer front of it. Wow. And, and then there would have been the chair, the burial chambers cut into the rock at this place. So you need to okay. be able to imagine so that. This is, that's a, just been chipped away this has all been chipped away to okay. create this place of worship. So they went back very quickly before the sun could go down. They didn't move. They observed the Sabbath, probably did what they always had done but with great despair. But there was one woman who was not among the 12, but followed Jesus very closely, Mary Magdalene. Right at dawn on Sunday morning, when the Sabbath was over, she gathered herself and perhaps another group of women and made the journey back from Bethany over just to my right shoulder, right here to the Holy Sepulcher. That long walk, what was she thinking? She was reliving in her mind everything that the Lord had done, everything that the Lord had done for her and began to wonder, is this it? Did it matter? Was it all an illusion? But she made the journey not because of what he had done for her, but because she loved him. He was her friend. With her head downcast, she makes her way to the old quarry where there are many tombs, and she sees the rock on which Jesus died. And she begins to see in her eye that the boulder, that the stone that was sealed, it was not in the right position. She was troubled, she was worried. She goes and she looks and she sees that the tomb is open and she goes in and there's nothing there. There is nothing there. And somebody says, why do you look for the living among the dead? Among all these tombs, why are you here looking for the one who is not dead? Uh, when, when this is a, a Roman city, Aeolia Capitolina, um, uh, the emperors and the governors of this area built worship spaces, worship temples for the Roman gods. Okay. And they intentionally built them over holy sites of the previous occupants, which okay. were the Jews and the Christians. And so uh, when uh, the Council of Nicaea gave Constantine permission to find the, uh, not just permission, they commissioned him to find the tomb of Jesus, they were able they were able to find where the tomb of Jesus was by where those temples had been built. Oh. As they dug away the platform of the of the pagan temples that had been built here, they were able to find the they were able to find 
the exact place based on based on information they had from the, the uh, from, from history from history uh, from historians who knew more or less where it was, and uh, and they were they were able to simply move away the Roman the Roman parts that were there and to find the place marked by graffiti most likely. Marked by graffiti, <laughs> marking this as the place That's fantastic. Uh, that, that had been venerated as the burial place of Jesus. If it was a story, if they decided to let's let's make a plot where we're going to say we he, we believe he rose, like we'll hide the body, but we'll pretend that he's risen. Yeah. What's that get them? Yeah. It doesn't get them any money. It doesn't get them fame. Um, it actually it actually ends their lives. It gets them killed. And none of them turn around at some point and say, hey, we made it all up. It's just a joke. Right. Everyone relax. Nobody, nobody yeah. backs out of the story and says, you know, you don't, we have no evidence of that. No. They all went to their deaths still saying, this is what we saw. Yeah. And, and that, for me, so I, part of why I believe is I believe on the testimony of those first witnesses. She ran with great joy. She ran and she told the other apostles about it. And Cephas, Peter, he came and they all came running to find that the tomb was empty. Not only did he rise from the dead, not only was this a new chapter in the life of the church, in the life of the apostles, but this was a beginning of a new world, a new era in the life of humanity. And it was because the tomb was empty. Ade stay. He is risen. Some consider Pentecost to be the point where the early Christian church truly began. It started off as a group of scared apostles and disciples, huddled in a small room celebrating the Jewish holiday Shavuot. Men and women fearing for their lives, unsure of what to do next, waiting for a sign. The tradition describes a mighty wind bursting through the room, tongues of fire descending upon them. Soon their fear was replaced with conviction, confidence, purpose. My name is Robert Fiducia, and I spent some time at Mount Zion with theology student Louisa Court and seminary director Father Chris Ryan to learn how this event sprung forth from the early church. Well, Louisa, our, our time in the Holy Land We've just been filled with these little moments of big surprise. Yeah. And and one of those was was being here in, in here in the upper room where we honor the descent of the Holy Spirit. But but also this whole district of Jerusalem that well, I mean Christianity had to start somewhere, had to have a, an origin. And this is the spot. You know, and it began as we believe we have the Feast of Pentecost as the birthday of the church. It, it's yeah. just overwhelming to think about that. It's so cool to think, right? I mean yeah. This, this church thing, this Christianity thing that I know is so much a part of, of your life and of my life. I'm, I'm a theology student, I work for the church, you know, and I, that's in Australia, on the other side of the world. And, you know, here we are where it all started in this, in this one spot and this one event that effectively changed the course of history and changed the face of the world. Uh, it's just so cool to think about. I love Pentecost, so I'm going to go find Father Chris and ask him a few questions about it. We're back here at the Zion Gate. We covered the story from Jesus dying and rising again. 
and he's ascended into heaven and then we have Pentecost and we celebrate Pentecost in the church about 50 days after Easter. We actually believe that that was the case, that pe the Pentecost event happened about 50 days after the resurrection. Why, why do we believe that? We can be pretty confident of that because Pentecost happens as a Jewish feast right. 50 days after the Feast of Passover. So the, the feast that we now celebrate as a Christian feast has a Jewish origin. And so when it says that they were gathered on the Feast of Pentecost, we know that that took place 50 days after the events of Jesus' death and resurrection. Yeah, cool, cool. And how do we know that this is the place? What, what leads us to that conclusion? Well, basically, it's a, there's a long-standing tradition that the upper room, particularly the room of Pentecost, was in this area. So we celebrate and acknowledge it just to my, to yeah. my left. But it's based on the fact that there's been a, a memory of this is where they were, this is where they gathered. And the fact that we have that, we know that the early Christian community gathered here, makes it highly likely, I think, that the room was in this area as well. Yeah. Wow, wow, it's so cool to think about. And then what happens after that? The church just like explodes pretty much from there. So after the Pentecost moment, the apostles go out and they agree to, to go to different parts of the world in order to reclaim their faith. We don't have a lot of records about where they all went, yeah. but we know that Peter went to Rome, we know that Thomas went to India, we're pretty sure that Andrew went to what's now Turkey, yeah. or what we call Asia Minor. Um, they spread out in order to share what they'd experienced in the power of the spirit that they've just been given. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, well, cool. Thanks. Thanks for opening up. It's, it's okay. Awesome. My pleasure. Well, you know, I, I shared with you about how I really delayed giving my heart over to God and giving my life over to God because, because I was afraid, you know? And, yeah. and that's very common among teenagers. You know, I kind of just knew God was gonna make me weird. <laughs> you know, maybe he did, I don't know. But, but what, do you, what do you say to, to people who are just fighting fear? I think fear of God is something very real, but not in the biblical sense. It's holding back. I mean, I, I mean, firstly, I think I'd, I'd say that we're all scared of God in some way because when God comes close, that we're both drawn and also like, oh my goodness, what's going to happen next? You yeah. Know? So the story I, I love to tell uh, young people comes from when I was in year eight at high school and it was a swimming carnival and you could stay back after school if you got permission and my mum worked just across the road. So I got the permission to go. And um, the kids who had the lockers above me at school, they were in year 11 of high school. And uh, they were good guys. And they said to me, do you want to come and jump off the 10 metre tower? And I didn't want to kind of chicken out. I was sort of a bit like, you know, it was nice that they asked me, you know, some older kids. And, but it was, I'd never jumped off the three metre tower or the five metre tower, let alone the 10 metre tower. You yeah. know? And it's funny thing about 10 metres, 10 metres like that isn't that far. 10 metres like that is a really long way. Yeah. Yeah. So we got, we got up to the top and um, there's these green, green guild kind of guys who are all kind of a bit scared and nervous. And, they tried to reassure me and say, look, you can take all the time you need. But when I got up there, they said, look, we're going to teach some other guys how to do a backflip, so you're going to have to go first. And so I remember standing on the edge and, uh, and jumping off. And I was, I was so scared. I was so scared. But I, I did it. I jumped. And, you know, you have plenty of time to think on the way down. It wasn't like it just happened in an instant. I, I could think of how scared I was as I was going <laughs> Your down. life flashed before your eyes. <laughs> kind of. But I hit the water yeah. and, um, and went... You know, went a long way down and then I came back up and I just remember this feeling of elation mm. that I'd done that. You know, it was such a rush, it was so much fun and I'd done it, you know, like as far as I knew I was the only kid in my, in my year who had jumped in and done that. Yeah. And I was really excited about it and I often use that as a, just a little bit of a story to say to people, you know, we're often scared of lots of things in life and one of the things we can most be scared about is what would it mean for me to give my life to God? What would it mean to say that I actually want to make Jesus the center of my life, yeah. um, but it's an adventure. Um, you are scared, you are scared, but you jump off and you jump into something extraordinary, yeah. an amazing adventure. And I, I can honestly say this, you know, in the, the years since that decision that I made where I really wanted to encounter God and where I felt like he really revealed himself to me, in the years since then, um, it's been many, many things, yeah. but it's never, ever been dull. Right. It's been an extraordinary adventure. And so I often say that to young people and say, don't, don't hold back and miss out on something amazing because you're, a, you're frightened.
happening in Jerusalem around that time, the, that 50 days later, and with the disciples, especially, what were they up to? I, I think probably life in Jerusalem was more or less going on as normal. You've got to remember that crucifixions happened all the time. People had bizarre stories about followers and all that sort of stuff that, that went on after those things. So I think Jerusalem life probably went on. But for this little group of disciples, life was very, very different because over those 50 days, we have the various resurrection appearances where Jesus has shown that he's alive. And we have that mystery we call the Ascension where he returns to the Father. The enmity that has been aroused against them hasn't dissipated and so they're worried. So they're actually quite scared of what's going on. And so the story has that they're in the upper room and they're not, uh, they're not excited or enthusiastic, they're, they're fearful. They're worried about what's going to happen. And then Pentecost happens and that changes everything. So after the resurrection, many of the apostles and the disciples were having appearances of the risen Lord, but they didn't know what to do. We knew that he was risen, but now what do we do? What now? That was the big question. So Jesus had instructed them to remain in Jerusalem and to gather in the upper room and pray and to wait. I can imagine what the time was like, the excitement, the wonderment, um, perhaps a little bit of fear as well. But then one day, when they were gathered, praying, the big wind came and tongues of fire fell upon them and they felt a power that they had never felt before. Not only did they have the joy of the resurrection, but they had the power of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit began the church on that day. No longer did they say, what do we do? Now what? They knew what to do. They had received their mission. They went out to the world from this spot. They preached and they taught and they did wonderful, miraculous things. They started churches all around the known world and those churches had dedicated ministries to the widow and to the poor. They proclaimed the gospel and brought new meaning to people's lives. The successors of the apostles, they began to found universities. They began to found hospitals. And all around the world, the work that is built on the faith of the apostles is now raising the dignity of all people. That's the work that the Holy Spirit began right here in this spot. Looking up over at that hillside, and we're at dusk at the sea, which I love this that we're here right now because that's the hillside yeah. where people were gathered at the multiplication of loaves at dusk because they said to Jesus, um, They've been listening to, for you, for, to you for a while and it's getting late. What are we going to do? You know, and then there's the feet, there's the miracle of the loaves and fish, you know? Yep. So, you know, kind of like, I mean, just Louisa had asked earlier, but what is it about, about that story that, that they made the decision, that Mark made the decision, I'm writing about that? Mm, that's a great question. I think there's a few details that are really, really important. Okay. So the first thing is we've got this level where they're just, they're hungry. Jesus has been yeah. teaching them. There's been a whole lot of things going on. The disciples have been out doing some ministry. Mm -hmm. And then we're told they come to this lonely place. Mm -hmm. And and in and you know, look around. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. It really feels like that. I mean, yeah, you know, I mean these days the highway's not too far from us, but it, you get this sense of it being isolated. It's far from things. It's far yeah. from things. And in the in the Greek, the word Mark Mark uses there is is eremos, which is desert. And so they've been taken out into a deserted place. And Jesus teaches the people when he sees all the people there and they, he says they looked harassed and dejected mm. like sheep without a shepherd mm. and he's moved by that and he teaches them at length yeah. so part of the reason why they're stuck out here at night is jesus has gone on for a bit <laughs> talking to them because he wants to meet their need mm. they're hungry for mm. something mm. They, they want to be fed mm. and they want to be fed 
and Jesus responds to that by teaching them. So we're talking about a deeper hunger than just food. Oh, yeah. But then it gets to this point in the evening and it's too far to get home. There doesn't seem to be enough food. Yeah. And so Jesus says, well, let's feed them here. What, what have we got? And you know, he says, well, <laughs> there's, <much>. there's <laughs> two fish, five loaves of bread. And, uh, and Jesus says, bring them to me. Yeah. We're told then that he takes the bread he blesses it, breaks it, and gives it. Yeah. And that's really, that's really important language. Yeah, the next time that language gets used is in the Last Supper. Right. And so you've got these two moments, Jesus teaching them at length and then feeding them, wow. which is our Eucharist. That's right. Yeah. Every yeah. Sunday, that's what we do. Yeah. Uh, we gather and we listen to the Word of God to be taught by the mm. Lord and then to be fed by him. Yeah. Marx put that in really deliberately. That's yeah. intentional. Yeah. That, that would have all sorts of resonances for the community that he's writing for. Oh, what we do is actually yeah. in continuity with it connects with this story. Yeah. So this story is explaining what mass looks like. That's yeah. So cool. The other bit that I think is really important yeah. as he feeds all of them. Yeah. There's this really curious detail which says at the end of that meal of the meal, there there are there are 12 empty or 12 baskets full of scraps. Yeah. Now, the number 12 is really significant mm. for the people of Israel. Right. Um, so we immediately perhaps think of the 12 apostles. Yeah. And that's yeah. an important part of it. But the reason is that there were 12 tribes of Israel. Right. So right. 12 tribes constituted the people of Israel. The 12 disciples or the 12 apostles are actually showing that Jesus is forming a new Israel, a new yeah. group. The idea here, I think, is that Jesus is feeding everybody, yeah. all of the people of God, all of the people of Israel. Yeah.